Hello, my pretties. It's Dr. C again, and I am at the movie theater so that we can talk about today's topic. So today we're going to be talking about werewolves in pop culture. And you notice when we did the other sections, right, we talked about really important and seminal texts. So for witchcraft, we talked about the Malleus Maleficarum. For vampires, we talked about Dracula. But one of the things you'll notice is that there really isn't like a seminal text for werewolves. And there really isn't a seminal set of or like all encompassing set of tropes that everybody agrees upon when it comes to werewolves, other than literally the moon and wolves. So what I've done today is pulled together a few, the very few texts that do exist that are relevant for werewolves, and then also combine that with a discussion of the very few films in which werewolves are really important characters. So while this may have been something that took a lot of different foci when we were talking about witches or vampires, when it comes to werewolves, there's actually a lot less material out there to work with and to study as anthropologists. So let's get started. So if we're going to start a discussion about wolves as interacting with people and wolf people or other kind of lycanthropes, we actually want to begin the story of Little Red Riding Hood. So Little Red Riding Hood is a Middle Eastern fairy tale. It originates in the hundred years after the birth of Christ, and it is kind of foundational in a lot of the fairy tale stories and like mythical collections throughout the Middle East and Europe. So we see different variants of it, but it's always the same idea of a little girl, one who's innocent, a wolf man or a wolf creature that comes and talks to her, um, who harasses her, she flees from him, she goes to meet a family member, and lo and behold, it's the wolf in disguise. But we know the really codified version, which is the Brothers Grimm version. And there, she's, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, she has a little basket, all of those kind of iconic images, it's a grandmother specifically, etc. But this is really the first example of that wolf human myth appearing in kind of a werewolf form in fairy tales, right? And this sort of segues from where we talked about the Viking examples, the Scandinavian examples, the ancient Greek examples, the ancient Roman examples, and how those are all sort of tied together. Well, this is sort of where it all starts to come into that mythical form with the Little Red Riding Hood myth. It takes those earlier ideas and kind of codifies them into this mythological morality tale that includes this wolf man character who is frightening and dangerous. Now, we do have uh, Wagner the Werewolf, and this is from 1857. And this is a predecessor to the Penny Dreadful, which we talked about before. This is a cheap little novel that was the first attempt to really create this idea of a werewolf to take this mythological fairy tale creature and to create like a serial story around a grand hero and a grand villain, etc. But like, it's a really bad book. Like it's poorly written, like the character development's terrible. There's a lot of inconsistencies about it. So like it does a terrible job of actually like structuring how the werewolf mythology is to be understood. Like it has all of these weird fe features that don't apply in other werewolf circumstances and that don't get caught into the canon. It's one of the few cases where we see like curing a werewolf, but then the things that you have to do to cure a werewolf in Wagner, uh, in the Wagner story, like aren't the same things that are in other cases. So it's really like an outlier, but it's the first attempt to make like a mainstream, like non fairy tale version of the werewolf story. Now we also have the book of werewolves, and this is from 1865. This is Sabine Baring Gould, who is an anthropologist in England, or an early anthropologist. And if you remember, we talked about how the Salem witch trials became like hella interesting in the 1860s in the United States. And that's because in the 1860s around the West, we saw this idea of like looking at earlier mythos or looking at historical stories. And this became like very in vogue. And so there was a big, 
you know, draw towards archaeology and neoclassicism, etc. So in the U.S., we went back to our old myths and stories like the Salem witchcraft trials. Well, in Europe, they did a similar thing. And so Baring Gould writes this book, The Book of Werewolves, and it's like still considered the best academic writing about werewolves like period it's still considered the best book about this topic like there's so little scholarship on the concept of werewolves that when i was looking for readings for you guys like this is pretty much it like this is there's there are very few articles that look at the idea of werewolves in an academic way and there aren't any other books there are tons and tons of books about witchcraft there are tons and tons of books about vampires this is it now it's a good book it is kind of like a mix of different types of literature all in one book. So you've got historical stories, you've got folklores, you've got um, biomedical and scientific arguments about werewolfism, and then you have like some very like sketchy true crime, like really like hot gossip tabloid kind of stories in it. So it's, it's a whole mix because he was basically just collecting everything that he could find that was about this topic. So it's a really, really interesting piece of historical and like folkloric piece of literature, right? And, you know, as an anthropologist, this is really interesting because it pulls together the bio side, it pulls together history and language, it pulls together archaeology, it pulls together culture and folklore. Like, it's the epitome of an anthro text, all four fields. But, like, it also can't really differentiate between myth and scientific reality and, like, fact and fiction. And so, in that sense, it's a little blurry as well. Now, the next text that I want to talk about, we're going to jump all the way to 1933, and that is The Werewolf in Paris. And this is a Gothic novel, so that's that same artistic tradition that gave us Bram Stoker's Dracula, the Gothic novel. And it is about a werewolf in France during a period of war. Now, the book itself is super iconic. It sets a lot of tropes that we associate with werewolves, the idea of like changing under the light of the moon and running around in a city interacting with people in both your human form during the day and then your werewolf form at night it also includes some elements which are kind of like vampire-y um in terms of the way that it like drains life force and like interacts with others and there's sort of a demonic element but regardless it is an incredibly iconic book and it's probably one of the most popular pieces of written fiction about werewolves but it's never been made into a movie and it's never had a sequel. It's never really been expanded upon. So it ends up just being like a standalone piece, which is a little, you know, surprising considering how iconic and like beloved it is. Nobody's really grown off of it. Um, we do have a film and that is A Werewolf in London. And The Werewolf in London is, I mean, it's totally different than Werewolf in um, Paris in terms of its plot and in terms of its idea. Um, Werewolf in London has this whole plot line about the exotic Orient and this Tibetan figure that actually is the werewolf. And so just like vampire stories, there's this degree of like the exotic outsider and like fear of the immigrant or like fear of the unknown. But this was the first time on film that we see an anthropomorphic werewolf, that we see a man that it turns into a werewolf and he's got a werewolf head, but he still walks around on two feet and he still has hands and like he's not a dog, he's not a wolf, he's actually a man wolf beast. So this is the first time that that is depicted on film. Um, however, the most famous werewolf film would come a few years later, and that is The Wolfman. And this film, for people who love special effects, who love, like, makeup and hair and all of that, like, The Wolfman is fucking iconic because it has all of this crazy makeup and, like, these interesting special effects with, like, the lightings and the shadows to make the makeup look even more spooky. And so it's really, really iconic because when we imagine the werewolf, like this is what we see and this shapes the way that we really imagine what a werewolf looks like. Like in Werewolf in London, like he still pretty much just looks like a man and, and there's not a lot of special effects. With the wolf man, like it really is like all of the hair, all of the fur, it's what you envision a werewolf to be. And it's 
not written after any famous book because again there's just not a lot of literature about werewolves so actually the screenwriter just wrote a funny po poem about a wolf man and then really dug it and decided to write a whole book based on it so a lot of the stuff that's in it is just th that one screenwriter's idea about what a wolf should look like like what a werewolf should be and so all of our depictions ever since that include a lot of these same elements like you know the fur coming out of the face and like the teeth like growing in the mouth and the hands being like an extra like elongated and you know the snout being slightly different all of that came from this one screenwriter and all of his special effects dudes being like yeah this is what i vision a werewolf to be and so that's where we get it from we don't get it from a special text we don't get it from any, like you know there's not a single canon throughout history and literature it's just the dude that made this movie and his staff were like this is what a werewolf should be and that's how we think of it now and so the werewolf starts appearing in the wolfman vision, right, with that same kind of like body shape and head shape, etc., all throughout the 1940s and 50s. But he's a side character, right? He's not actually the main focus. So he shows up a lot as like an assistant to Dr. Frankenstein and Frankenstein's monster. He shows up a lot as like a buddy of Dracula. Um, but he also appears in flicks with like the mummy and the swamp thing and things like that. But the werewolf himself, right, the wolf man himself is not actually the main focus. He's just like part of the horror entourage in all of these 40s and 50s like campy B movies, etc. Now, that would all change in 1981 when An American Werewolf in London came out. And this is like, it's not a remake of a werewolf in London. It's a whole new plot, but it's still that idea of like a foreigner being a werewolf and like coming to London and having to deal with the werewolf experience. But it is like a horror film, but it's not really, it's like a buddy comedy. It's very funny. It's kind of quirky and weird, um, but it was released at the same year when a lot of other werewolf stories were really popular. So right at the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, like the werewolf mystique became really, really popular. Um, it kind of makes sense. It was a time with, of like economic depression and like a time when we were coming to terms with environmentalism. So man's relationship with nature was really, really prominent. Whereas like man's relationship with wealth and decadence was not a big deal. So low on the vampires and high on the werewolves. And so like Wolfen and the Howling were also released in the same year. But American Werewolf in London was like the winner of the pack because it was funny and it was campy, but it also had all of these like ridiculous special effects. You guys watched one of the transformation scenes in the module. You guys were assigned to look at that. And like, these were groundbreaking and a lot of special effects today that have to do with like how hair is put on the body and fur and like animals are depicted. A lot of that was directly shaped by this film. So it really, while it's important for like the werewolf like trajectory in media, it is super, super important in the history of special effects in film. So Amer An American Werewolf in London, if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out. It's a fun little movie with some really, really cool special effects, especially for its time, 1981. Super, super cool special effects. Um, a few years later, like I said, early 80s, you get this kind of like obsession with werewolves. You have Teen Wolf, and this is your coming of age story. But ladies get coming of age stories that have to do with witches, bros get stuff related to our animals shit i don't know why i did a pirate there my bad guys like raw animals there we go um teen wolf was lame as shit like if you've ever seen it like it is corny as all get out but it made michael j fox like a household name so it turned him into like kind of you know your teenage sex icon like put him on teen beat we love him so that's teen wolf now mtv has a tv series that's like loosely based on it but it was this idea of like what if you were doing your coming of age and like coming to terms with your male like sexual prowess and that's represented through the werewolf and much the same werewolves and metamorphs in general are reoccurring characters in the harry potter films so like I had never read the books and when I start watching the movies and there's a character named Remus Lupin, I was like, holy shit, is he a fucking wolf? And then I watched the entire rest of the film and I was like, yup, he's the wolf.
Saw that coming. Oh, and also the other one, Fenrir Greyback, right? So there's another character. Fenrir, where have we heard that before? Again, that's the giant wolf that is Loki's son in the Viking mythology. Um, so in the Harry Potter universe, it is an infection. The idea of the sympathetic werewolf, the idea of the werewolf not being able to control himself and that being a terrible thing and that it's a curse. Um, the man loses his mind while he's in wolf form. This is not the only way that werewolves are depicted, right? The werewolf out of control. Sometimes they're in control and sometimes they're not. But it does often appear as a way of adding like a tragic nature to the werewolf character. And then, as we said, with those 1940s and 50s horror, you know, television shows and comics, etc., with the Harry Potter universe, with the Twilight universe, you have werewolves, but they are secondary to witches or vampires or other uh, like scary gothic horror figures. And so we have werewolves in Twilight because why the fuck not, right? And so they are secondary, but like. Stephanie Miller does this interesting thing where she associates it with Native Americans to really tie in that idea of connection to nature. And so vampires in the Twilight universe are unnatural and like unholy, whereas werewolves are natural. It's a controlled ability, so you can decide when you are in wolf form and when you are in man form. So it's not a curse. It's not a negative. It's actually like kind of a really beautiful alternative depiction that's tied to other depictions of the werewolf, but it's its, its own unique an interesting thing. And so she's kind of brought in this idea of the skinwalker, the idea of like the weird creature, the, the Native American spirit who is truly in touch with nature and takes on this animal form. And so in that sense, it's, an, it's a unique, and I might even say like beautiful, as if something in Twilight could be beautiful because that thing is a hot mess. But the way that they view werewolves is actually kind of like really beautiful within that mythology. All right, guys, thanks so much for our brief little lecture on werewolves in pop culture. I can't wait to talk about it more in lecture this week. Thanks so much, guys.